Good morning, everyone. It's great to have visitors, special visitors. Jenny and Alex Harris are, Harris are going to be talking to us about the work of Mission Aviation Fellowship. And it's very good of them because they weren't down to come here originally. It was somebody else. And they've stepped in at the last moment. So a great big thank you to you both for coming to us from Western Supermare. So our peace candle is lit. Let us say together the Lent prayer. Lord, may Lent be a time of inward searching that makes me more able to look with compassion at the needs of the world, my neighbours and my own family. Amen. It's an absolute joy to be here with you this morning. Um, late, lateness and short notice, you know, before the Lord, that's what it's all about, isn't it? And we should be ready at any time. So we're grateful that the weather was fine this morning as we made our journey here from Weston. And uh, we're delighted to be with you and to tell you a bit about MAF. Alex and I um, heard about MAF when we were youngsters, when the Aukar Indians killed those four American missionaries that went to them. And we've supported it ever since, but we've only been speakers for them uh, in the last about three, four years. Um, and because we have other responsibilities in our church and always have. We used to live in Glastonbury, so a bit about us. We used to live in Glastonbury um, years ago at the old police station down in Benedict Street. Then we were moved to Wells where our son was converted. Uh, and then we've been all sorts of other places. In those days, the police moved you quite often at a fortnight's notice. Um, and uh, you just had to get up and go. Uh, so, so we're delighted to be back in Glastonbury and uh, we're going to sing uh, hymn number 81. Now thank we all our God with heart and hands and voices. Number 81.
Yes, Lord, we thank you for your assurance that you are the everlasting God from the very beginning until Jesus comes again and into eternity. We thank you, Lord, that you are such a wonderful Father. And we thank you that you supply our needs and you bless us day by day. And now we pray as we go into this service that you will uh, touch each one of us in the way that we need today, whether that be to still our hearts, to bring healing, to just encourage us in the walk that we have. And we pray that we might know your presence and experience the Holy Spirit in this place this morning. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now we're going to have a reading. Thank you very much. Yes, the reading is taken from Psalm 25, and it's verses 1 to 10. If you want to look in the Pew Bible, it's at 550. And it's entitled, A Prayer for Guidance and Protection. So Psalm 25, verses 1 to 10. To you, O Lord, I offer my prayer. In you, my God, I trust. Save me from the shame of defeat. Don't let my enemies gloat over me. Defeat does not come to those who trust in you, but to those who are quick to rebel against you. Teach me your ways, O Lord, and make them known to me. Teach me to live according to your truth, for you are my God, who saves me. I always trust in you. Remember, O Lord, your kindness and constant love, which you have shown from long ago. Forgive my sins and errors of my youth, in your constant love and goodness. Remember me, Lord, because the Lord is righteous and good. He teaches sinners the path they should follow. He leads the humble in the right way and teaches them his will. With faithfulness and love, he leads all who keep his covenant and obey his commands. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you for that. We're now going to sing hymn number 407, Hear the Call of the Kingdom. I'm not sure I know this one. I'm hoping I know the, the uh, music, but I'm going to listen to you sing the first couple of lines, and then I'm going to pick it up. <laughs>
What a lovely missionary hymn. Uh, great words. Thank you very much for choosing that one. Alex is now going to bring us um, a ministry. Well, I'm in a different situation this morning because uh, whereas I'm used to speaking, I don't think I've ever spoken from this psalm before. And uh, when we knew that we were coming here, we had a phone call. I think it was uh, in the middle of a meeting we were taking on Tuesday morning. And uh, I was just saying, well, what are we going to say? What are we going to talk about, Lord? What message should I bring? And uh, I kept getting 25 in my mind. And uh, then I realized it was Psalm 25. And I was thinking perhaps it was Psalm 119. But no, it wasn't. It was Psalm 25. And it's a lovely little psalm, and I found some lovely thoughts there that I want to share with you very briefly this morning before we go on with talking to you about MAF. And at the start it says, O oh Lord, I give my life to you, or I pray to you in this way. And I just saw this sense of the psalmist here expressing his confidence in God rather than idols. And he was looking at the reality. And he goes on in verse 2 to say, I trust in you. Which I think is both a challenge and an encouragement to us. You see, all of us are faced with that situation about, do we accept what God is saying? Do we know who he is? Have we thought about accepting him as saviour? Well, I can say now that that is something that I did nearly 70 years ago when I was about 10 or 11. And I always remember, it was just a meeting I went to, it was a Billy Graham research thing, um, and it was uh, relayed to our local cinema, and I made a decision there for the Lord Jesus to become my saviour, which is a personal thing, because nobody else can do for it for me, or for you, we have to do it ourselves and asked Jesus to change us. And I was able to go home after that meeting and tell my dad that I'd given my heart to Jesus. Now, he was a minister, but he died shortly after that year. And uh, he was very ill, but I didn't necessarily know that. I'd been away at boarding school and came home for Christmas, and uh, the Lord called him home. But what I have realized is <clears throat> always the Lord Jesus has been with me, helping me, guiding me, and leading me. And that applied both when I was in the police and serving him here in Weston and then on to Wells, as Jenny said. And then I went back to Weston where I was promoted. And then we went on to Radstock and Bath and you name it, we went. Because <laughs> that's what happened when I joined the service back in the early 1960s. But... As a teenager, I realized that I needed to make a firm commitment for the Lord as my personal savior. And it was really a personal recommitment more than anything else and find the reality there. But as verse four says, what we also need to be doing constantly is saying to the Lord, Lord, show me the right path. Show me what I should be doing, where I should be going, what I should be getting. And that is quite something to think about because I need to know it. And by the way, the right words, right path, means the path of wisdom and also being open to instruction from God, which I always find to be a challenge that does lead us in that way. But all through our life as a couple, and this year we're going to celebrate our, was it diamond wedding anniversary, isn't it, I think? 60 years anyway. <laughs> so, and all the way through, God has led us and directed us and blessed us and showed us his will for us. And that is so great. And it just, you know, verse 7 really t is the whole key of this. It says, Lord, remember me. I think that's lovely that the psalmist is saying on a personal thing, Lord, remember me. But then he goes on to say another lovely thought. He says, remember me in the light of your unfailing love. Because that is the key thing of the Christian faith. God loves us individually more than anything else. And he wants the best from us. 
But I think there's a little bit of a, a little hint there saying, look, if I've done something wrong, I'm sorry. Just remember me in your love, not remember me for all the things I do that are wrong. And that's exactly what the Lord wants to do for us. Because he loves us so much as individuals. And he always needs us to say, Lord, forgive me. Confess our sins. And he blesses us in this way. But the Lord will lead us, it says in verse 10 as well, with unfailing love and faithfulness. Well, we can testify that for our marriage all the time, that God has led us and blessed us and keeps us close to himself. What a lovely thought. You see, I know that I need always help from the Lord. I can do things and I can make a pig's ear of them pretty quickly. But when I walk in the way God's leading, everything fits into place and there aren't the tensions and the problems. But you see, the second part of that verse is a challenge. It says, the Lord leads with unfailing love and faithfulness to whom? Only to those who obey his commandments. And that's a challenge. You see, I've heard people say, oh, we don't have to worry about the law anymore. That's the Old Testament. We can forget that. It's not in the New Testament. Sorry, but it is. Now, I haven't got that high, but my senior pastor tells me that there are over 60 commands in the New Testament that we should be obeying. And I'll tell you one or two of them. This, For example, in Matthew 4, Jesus said, Turn from your sins, turn to God, because the kingdom of heaven is near. And the Bible tells us that the Lord says, I want you to become my children. I want you to love me. I want you to accept me as Savior. But it also warns there is a time when that offer will not be there. You must love the Lord your God, it goes on, Jesus saying. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And you must forgive, in other words, those who sin against you because your heavenly Father will then forgive you. But you've got to forgive as well. Well, lots of thoughts there. If we've trusted the Lord Jesus as our personal Savior, we can rely upon him in everything we do. And all I can say is, for all my experience of being a Christian, I know the Lord has never let me down and has blessed us time and time again. Oh, we've had some struggles and we've had some problems. And I know when we were living in Wells that uh, Jenny had troubles getting new school uniform for our son because police wages in those days were very low. But God still provided. And that is the wonder. We've never gone without the essentials. God has always supplied. And all I can say is this is something that we believe in, certainly in the work of math. Because everyone who works for math and everyone certainly on the mission field knows the Lord Jesus as their personal saviour. And that is so important when we look at that side of it. And so as we come to looking at uh, talking about math a little bit more, if we can, I thought, well, let's have some pictures as well so we can see what we're doing. And that is the obvious first question. Now, my legs, as I've said to one or two of you, are not behaving themselves today. So I'm going to use this stool and sit down rather than stand all the time. And I hope you'll, you'll accept that. But what is math? Simply put, it's a Christian earline with a mission. We work in over 27 developing countries, and of course it's also a registered charity in this country. But our purpose in Bath is to share God's love through aviation, technology, and is transforming lives today. Do you know, we've got a fleet of about 135 planes or thereabouts, and I was looking at some of the information and those early planes when we started, just after the end of the Second World War, 
They were very basic planes, and they were fabric covered. Now, <clears throat> those of you who know history may remember that some of our planes in the Second World War were covered in fabric, because that's how they were put together and flew. And I think it was the Hurricane in particular was excellent at being shot at many times in the fabric, but it still flew on. It was one of those incredible planes. And when it got back to the airline, all they did was put more fabric on, and then it flew back again. And that is what there. Today, what have we got? We've got the use of strong aluminium in the frames, and of course, on the same on the planes. But the engines, too, have vastly improved. And these days, we're using really um, turbine-powered um, aircraft. And some of them, in fact, use jet fuel. And in some parts of the world, it's easier to buy jet fuel than it is any other aviation fuel. So what an amazing thing that is, that they are so much more powerful in that way. So really, the story of mass starts at the end, as I said, of the Second World War. And God spoke to men who were serving in the RAF and also in the American Air Force. And I well remember one of our founders in this country, and he said, because he was a New Zealand guy, came over here to fly with the RAF, amazing people that did that. And he was flying with Coastal Command. And they were flying quite large aircraft as they were seeking enemy submarines, as you know, across the ocean there. And he thought, as he was in this powerful plane, what could a plane do in the service of God? And that was the start of it. And American men, God was saying the same thing to there. And the end story is that math started. And they realized that planes could be used to help other people and bring relief anywhere that's needed. And that has gone on now for some 78, 79 years. When these uh, RAF fellows uh, decided that there must be a, a Christian work that they could do, um, they thought about it and decided that perhaps Africa would be a good place. There were <coughs> lots of missionaries in Africa, and, and uh, this is just after the war, and there were still missionaries out there. So they decided to do a survey um, of African mission stations and see whether the aircraft would be helpful or not. And uh, they discovered quite quickly that it took so long for missionaries to get to where they were serving. It took so long for a missionary to get someone that was poorly, or even the villagers, into a hospital. And they could see the need, but they weren't quite sure how it would all work out. But they persevered. And as God is likely to do, he showed them the way and he provided a plane. And um, they, they started off in a small way, I'm sure, with just a, one plane going from place to place. Um, but at one time, there was a, a, a family that needed to get to hospital. Their child was very poorly. There were no roads. The roads would have taken longer than the river. Um, and they had to go 150 miles by river. It took them three days with a poorly child. And it would have taken maybe minutes, maybe hours in an aeroplane. So they really understood how important an aeroplane would be in these types of situations. But also bearing in mind that there's more rivers than there are roads, <coughs> they decided to put some floats on one of the aircraft so that they could land on water. You can imagine, can't you, everybody's um, surprise, especially the local folk who saw a plane coming in and landing on water and then taking off afterwards. So this is one of our airplanes with the floats on. Uh, we still have them available and they are detachable so they can take them off when they're not needed and put them on where they are, which is really good. So it makes the aircraft usable under any conditions. Um, we've also, uh, MAF works with over 200 partners, um, and this shows where MAF is in operation in the world. So the American side is dealt with the headquarters in America, but the rest of uh, Africa and Asia is dealt with from the headquarters in Folkestone, here in, in Great Britain. Um, and so that shows you where we work, 
and then we have we work with 200 sorry 2000 i always read that wrong uh, 2000 now you'll see the names coming up save the children you'll know tfm uk aid and um the one that does the uh, bombs and things what's that one called just above the right one there the halo trust second row there on the right well oh in, yes the, the one uh, that princess diana um used a lot with the um and the two princes. Oh, and the two princes are still yeah, following me the that. Ones who follow it so, on so we work with over 2,000. This is just a few of them at the moment. Um, so we are the biggest humanitarian mission because we work with so many other organizations that bring aid and humanitarianism. Um, and also the medics that we take in, Medair, uh, we fly them. Uh, but all of us, as Alex said, all of our folks are Christians, so the message of salvation is also given. One of the things that we do often forget is that matter of travel. You know, we jump in our cars, we catch a bus, we catch a train in this country without thinking about it. When they're running, that is, of course. But uh, <clears throat> the reality is that some of the pictures that we'll show you in a minute will show you some idea what roads are like. You know, we talk about the, the country coming to a standstill with a few inches of snow. Well, how do you cope with a foot of mud when you're trying to drive a car? And it takes hours. And that is where math is so important. Well, you may remember some years ago, six or seven years, I can't remember what it was, there was quite a bad earthquake and aftershocks in Nepal. And we don't usually work in, in Nepal because uh, this one of those countries that doesn't welcome us, but they do welcome in what they call, en, uh, oh, having said that, I've lost it. Um, Non-government agencies, NGA, I'm trying to get the right word out. Um, and in fact, when those earthquakes were there, we, I think, have got about one helicopter in the whole fleet of MAF, but we hired helicopters, and that in the background is one of those that we hired, and uh, it does make you realise that we can get into places that others can't. And by the way, the guy on the right-hand side there, that is a guy we know very well. He's actually our senior pastor at our church, but he was a missionary based in Kathmandu for some, nearly seven years. So we know Steve, you know, very well and the work he did. And I know that he still goes over there now. But here's the helicopters that they had. We went in as an organization and helped the people in Nepal. And you know, the local people later said that the help they got were some Christians, but not from their own people, not from their monks. And it makes you think, God can and does use anything to further his kingdom. And that is a really thought. Now, all our pilots are professional. They are all commercial airline pilots before they can join us. So they're very, very clever, very much more qualified, I think, than, than the many commercial pilots. You know, they get lift off from Bristol, for example, going down to Spain, press a button, and they just sit there and wait till they get to the other end and have to land. Well, that doesn't happen with our planes because they're up and down often too quick. And I remember a story I read on one of our things. This particular guy, in one week, made over 30 flights. That's an incredible number of flights when you think about it. I think of all the jolly paperwork as well, because you've got to record everything you do for whichever country you're in on there. But how about that? That is a landing strip. Now, that takes some skill, and I tell you what, you need to load your plane properly to be able to assure you get off on a hill like that. But that is the standard that they have got and where it goes from there. Uh, MAF continues to expand and develop new opportunities 
and uh, it took three years of extensive research for MAF um, was officially launched um, in the Republic of Guinea uh, just about two years ago. Now, Guinea is a very, very poor country. Um, 178 out of 189 countries on the UN's Human Development uh, Index. So it's right down the bottom. And MAF had, has made inroads into there. The poverty in Guinea is very high. Life expectancy is only 61 years. And one in every 20 children don't survive to their first birthday. Um, World Health Organization says there is barely one doctor for 10,000 people. We think we've got it hard, don't we? And I know lots of people are suffering at the moment through not being able to get to doctors, but one doctor for 10,000 people. And that's not all in one town like we might live. That's spread over uh, the jungle and the areas um, that they are. Only a third of the population have access to clean water. So the disease is rife as well. And also, 55% of the population live below the breadline. So these are some of the countries that we go into to bring aid and relief and food, sometimes through other organizations, but using the advantage of planes in order to get to places quickly. Uh, but the great news, that first official flight took, uh, went into Guinea um, last year. Uh, the MAF pilot, Roy Rissenson, took American missionaries in a Cessna caravan uh, plane uh, from the southeast of the country to the capital, Conakry. I don't know whether that's how you pronounce it, but take it with me. Uh, and that is a caravan plane there, you can see. It's quite interesting, actually, digressing. They brought a brand new plane from America. They stripped out everything else inside it, put extra fuel tanks, and then flew it across the Atlantic, which is... <laughs> Mind-blowing in one sense for these planes, but they're very powerful as well because these are turbine planes as well. Sorry, dear. It's all right. Um, as, you, as you heard, all of our pilots are highly skilled and trained um, and not just relying on computers, which is what Alex was saying. Imagine landing on this airstrip, which Alex is going to bring up in a minute. Um, and many of the strips uh, that are used are surrounded by trees and any mistake would be end in disaster and uh, watch this landing. Well, we often get asked what happened about the COVID pandemic. Did it affect us? Well, yes, it did, but we were still able to fly. There were conditions and restrictions, but the re relief work continued. And we were certainly able to deliver thousands of COVID test kits and other things like oxygen, masks, hand washing, fresh water, all kinds of things. And I know in the end, we also took many of the uh, supplies that were needed, a lot of equipment. Over 20 tons of essential equipment were taken to various places and building materials and all the things that were needed to help those countries in that way. I don't know about you, but we seem to have a BC and an AC, don't we? before COVID and after COVID situation in our country and in our, our lives here. Um, and so uh, before COVID, there wasn't the need for the things. But once COVID came, there were needs. And um, MAF had to follow all the usual procedures. But they also were able to supply AstraZeneca vaccine, especially for Madagascar. Um, it's a remote and isolated community to live there. 500 vaccines were loaded on one of our Cessna caravans. Um, the aircraft uh, took a 40-minute flight, which saved a two-week overland journey. Now, as you and I know, you can't keep the vaccines out of a fridge for that long. And so there would have been no vaccines for those people had it not been for aircraft. Um, and then they took a further 14,400 doses to the northeastern part of Madagascar. Madagascar is a fairly uh, new place uh, that we've been working in, but the locations, many have no roads, and the roads, as I said, it would have taken two weeks to get them from one place to another, which wouldn't have helped anybody. 
So we're grateful that we've been able to meet in an emergency situation like everybody had to. And we're grateful that the people of Madagascar were benefited from the fact that planes could fly those things to them. Well, sometimes we're asked to transport somebody for an emergency reason. And one such request was made to one of our pilots called Nathan. And uh, he was serving in Papua New Guinea in the Indonesia area. And he was asked by a missionary, can you take us to a place called Dage? Now, no MAF plane had been there for some time. So although he was hesitant, he listened to the missionary and went and took him there. And he flew low over the airstrip to see if there were any trees or logs or other things that had come there since it was last used. But he was fairly confident he could land, so he did do that, and they landed. So Tim, the mission, and the others went off to find out what it was all about, because it was most unusual that when they landed, nobody was there. Normally all the locals come out when the plane comes in, but apparently... Two tribes were ready to fight. And when they saw the plane, they knew it was a math plane, and they got scared. Made me think of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden when they realized they were naked, and they heard God in the garden. They got scared, didn't they? And we know that story. <clears throat> but the people then knew they were doing something wrong. Didn't know why math was coming, but it broke the tension and then changed the thinking. And later, they came back and told Nathan the story was that a young man and a lady from two different tribes had fallen in love, wanted to get married. Quite normal. But the tribal elders said she wasn't worthy of him and opposed and prohibited the marriage. She was distraught. She went out, found a poisonous root, ate it, and died. We don't think of things like that, do we? But they're available, these horrible things. But the anger rose between the two tribes, which led to this potential tribal war. But... When everybody met and talked to them and sat around them, and this is actually a picture of um, Nathan sitting with the people later on, the Spirit of the Lord had come upon them and peace came in. So instead of being ready to fight, the missionary was able to share the gospel with them and what an impact that had. These again are words that remind us, a powerful reminder of the way God work through each of us. Who would have thought a plane flying low over an airstrip could stop a war? But it did. See, we cannot understand or know why, but God works in wonderful ways. Uh, recently, now I understand that the last time you had a speaker here, it was uh, workers from MAF that were home on furlough. Well, we had a friend home on furlough um, uh, recently this is Becky D Dillingham she's the actual pilot so she's a, a qualified pilot her husband um, is a house father with their two children um, and also works for MAF on the station that she's based at and it was our delight to meet them they were staying in Weston and uh, we had a, an evening with them took them out for a meal and uh, when we asked what you'd like to eat he said oh I'll have a steak we never have meat in Africa because it's all covered in flies and maggots when we buy it. <laughs> <laughs> so these are some of the conditions under which our lovely people work. We don't think about the practicalities sometimes, do we? Um, but just remember the workers as well out in these places um, that are giving their lives. I think um, in the past, if you went to be a missionary, it was your lifelong uh, it was going to be your life forever, wasn't it? People became missionaries and went out to whichever country they were going to. Um, but nowadays, mission work can be on a shorter period. You can say that you'll go for three years or you'll say you'll join and do as long as you feel that God leads you. So it's not 
a lifelong thing if you uh, volunteer for a mission to do some work or to visit a mission field. Um, so do bear that in mind. If you're talking to folks, young Christians especially, um, sometimes the early retired, they can go and do a tremendous work for God on a short-term basis. It doesn't have to be a lifetime. So do bear that in mind if you're speaking to anybody. It was lovely to have them and their children with us for an evening. And uh, I do really ask you to um, speak to people about being coming missionaries. I don't know whether any of you have the Western Daily Press, but um, I can't remember when, we, oh, September time. This was in our um, paper. Student makes dream a reality as he flies A to the world's poor. So this young man had, from Swindon, local, um, had taken aid, uh, to, you can read this afterwards if you like, but his ambition, he's still at school, his ambition is to be an MAF pilot. And he's already planned to do an engineering course, uh, electronics for aircraft engineering course, and that's his ambition. So there's another young man who's giving his life to the Lord in a missionary situation. So do, do bear those things in mind when you're talking to folks who don't know what to do with the rest of their lives. And we've also got the very latest um, uh, Flying for Life, which arrived, I think, on Friday. I didn't have much time to read it between then and now. I was registering at a marriage yesterday, so we... <laughs> Um, but I sat down and read it last night before I came, and I've highlighted a few things very roughly. So if you want to have a look at the very latest news um, from MAF, do pick that up. It'll be on the bookstore um, outside in a minute. We have got... Um, it's not really a bookstore because there's lots of other things out there of interest as well. So do please uh, have a look at that. We've also got some cards that you can fill out. If you want to hear a bit more about MAF in during this year, you will get three lots of posts. Uh, no, four lots of posts. Yeah. Uh, I think it's four lots of posts. That's all. It's not going to go on after that. And it takes you around the world to tell you about different places that we're working well, let me in. just tell you about the books a moment there. Yes. I just picked a couple of them. There is another one about a lady missionary. Mm. And the, her story is quite appalling when you read it. And uh, I've not got a picture of her there. But looking at these there, the, the one at the bottom, you can't actually uh, see it very well. But that is our history written by um, Stuart King, who was one of our founders and went on that first trip to Africa to explore and to look around there. And that gives the history there. I, the one at the top, eyes turned skyward because that was a, a story about another guy who became a math pilot, but he again had been in the RAF and some of the things he got up to. And I remember one time he was showing off a bit to some army guys, well you know what they're like in the forces, whichever force you're in is better than the others. So he was showing off and so he was nosediving, I think it was in like a meteor or something, one of those early jet craft. And he lost consciousness when he was diving down. And the army guys said it was the most impressive they'd ever seen a plane fly. So it came down and leveled up and just missed their heads. But he knew nothing about it. We do have some crazy people to work for math at times, I tell you, but it is good. But there are some things you can do. And Jungle Pilot, we mentioned, where we first got involved. When we were young teenagers, you know what it was? The four of them in a bright yellow aircraft flew, and they were trying to make contact with this tribe who were known as the Killer Tribe. Quite a frightening thought from there. So they landed and eventually they made approach from them, but of course we know the story, the Alka Indians killed them. But we heard Nat Saint, who was the pilot, I think, from memory, his widow came into this country and we heard her speaking. And it really had an impression on us as to what these people were doing. And we, as, we, as Jen said earlier, we followed the work of the math ever since mm -hmm. because of that side of it. But it's something to think of in what we come up with. But as we look at this whole concept of what you can do, and we made that, this journey with us, Jenny mentioned. Mm. And just to show you there, there's the sort of trips you do. 
And what happens is you'll get a, a magazine sent to you, and you'll get this information of the trip sent, four trips all together. At the end of it, if you want to still have flying for life sent to you, you'll be asked if you want it. So there's no long sense of lots of magazines and stuff coming to you. We we'll do it only for one year, and that's that. But we'll have those cards that you can sign up and join with if you want to know more. And it's a great magazine, this Flying for Life. In fact, for the first time, I've seen a picture of our new chief executive. We've met the previous one, but she's just retired. And we now have a new one in this way. So, you're going to say something about postcards? Or yes, I will. Now, I understand you already have a box for collecting postcards out in the, the hall. So, uh, that's another way that you can raise. We don't pressure, uh, uh, yeah, we, we don't uh, major on your financial giving. We believe in MAF that God supplies our needs. But what we do rely on is your prayers and your, before God, what you should give. Some of your time, some of your finance, uh, certainly your prayers is what we really, really want to, you to pray for. If you think any moment in a day when you think, hmm, oh, math comes into your mind, there will be a plane taking off or landing somewhere in the world every three minutes. Now, that is an amazing situation. We have more airstrips. We can't call them runways because you've seen an airstrip. You've seen two of them this morning. Um, so we have more airstrips than any other um, organization. So do please keep praying. That's what we want most of all, your prayers, because God will answer your prayers. If you pray for our finance, the finances will come. If you pray for the safety of our pilots, the pilots will be safe. If you pray for their families, the families will be encouraged. And so what we really need is for you to have an interest in MAF, follow us in one way or another, um, and also to pray for us. Of course, we need finance, and of course, we're grateful for everything that anybody gives. Um, and there are lots of ways of giving. We have a little collecting box which you can take with you and have it at home. I've got one for various things in our home. And every now and again, I empty my purse. Actually, it doesn't get empty very often now because I don't use cash, of course. Um, but, but anything, at, at a moment, I think, oh, I'll put that in there. And it's surprising, after a year, how it mounts up. You can also leave legacies to, um, you see so many calls for legacies on the television, don't you? Well, you won't see one for MAF, but do remember you can pay some things for, towards it. We are a Christian charity. Your prayers are more important than your cash. But if God prompts you, then please give to us and remember us in your prayers. Well, this is something I just found out about the other day. This is a guy called Donna. I'm not going to try and pronounce his surname. It's something like Old Lucia Reading or something. So, uh, but Dollar is his name. He took off in a plane in this country. Um, he works full time, by the way, but he's got a plane, he's got a license, and he took off on the 20th of February. And what he's trying to do is celebrate 120 years since planes started to fly. It's only 120 years, that's all, since those Wright brothers got their first flight. So he, Dollar is launching a year-long campaign, and he is aiming to land at 120 airfields across the UK in the course of this year, before the end of the year. And uh, he has been down to Oxfordshire already, and uh, that part of the, the world, and he intends to come down into the West Country in the near future. But he's hoping to raise some £12,000 for MAF with this. And that's just an incredible thing people come up with that we do value in that way. Well, we're almost to the end, but I want to just mention one person that you may have heard of. His name is Ryan Cola, and he is an American pilot. And he was um, flying down into um, Mozambique. And they've arrested him and impounded his plane. 
Now, he works for somebody called Ambassador Aviation, which is Matt's name in Mozambique. So he's one of our pilots, and he was flying, flying a Cessna 206. Now, that has been returned to Matt. So we do have the extra plane back, but Ryan is still in prison. And even trying to make contact with him has been difficult. They're talking of him smuggling various things. What he actually had on the plane was humanitarian aid from what he was taking out. But some of these countries don't accept it. So we would ask that you might pray for Ryan's release. As you can imagine, his wife and family are quite worried. And times when they've been promised they can speak to him at the last minute have been refused. So I'm not quite sure what the latest is on that, but I do know he's still in prison at the moment. So if we can remember Ryan in that way, I think that would be good. So I think at that point, we better stop this. Yeah, I, th I think we've taken a bit longer than we should have done. I'm so sorry. Um, but we're going to have the collection brought forward now, please. Father, we thank you for these gifts. We pray that they may be used in your service to the glory of your name. Mm. And as we bring these love gifts, we thank you for all the blessings and advantages we have in this country. May we remember these things and think of the work that goes on overseas where their living conditions are so much worse. So thank you, Lord. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Amen. And we're just going to uh, finish with a hymn, 418. We have a gospel to proclaim. And it's not just missionaries abroad, you know, that should be proclaiming it. It's each one of us that we witness day by day, to people that don't know Jesus, don't acknowledge him, don't even think about God. It's our lives that should be witnessing to others. We have a gospel to proclaim.
Father, we thank you for your presence with us this morning. We thank you for your love and your care. And we pray that as we go out now, you will continue with us, that you will lead us and guide us, and you will keep us safe. In Jesus' name, until we meet again. Amen.